Although the face has changed, the demeanour hasn't. It's now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. At every corner in Whitby, Oshawa, I heard about the government's cuts to health care. Doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, technologists and patients all told me the same thing. The impact of this government's cuts to health care are real. The Premier says she recognizes the importance of mental health services, but she cut 25 desperately needed staff at Ontario Shores Mental Health Sciences Centre in Durham late last year. This is on top of the 31 staff cut in 2013. Because of these cuts, some wait lists are now a year long. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier recognize how cruel it is to encourage those suffering from mental illness to seek treatment and then cut the very services they need? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, welcome back, everyone. And I want to uh, congratulate Lauren Coe on his by-election win and all of the candidates who put their names on the ballot, Mr. Speaker. Congratulations. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I know that the, uh, the leader of the third party has asked a specific question about health care, and I will uh, respond to that um, first by saying that, uh, that we have increased health care funding year over year. But, Mr. Speaker, all of that is within the context of our plan. We have a plan for growing jobs and growth in Ontario. We have a plan to invest in people and their talent and skills, Mr. Speaker. We are investing in infrastructure, which is creating 110,000 year, jobs a year right right now, Mr. Speaker, and will build well into the future. We are working on providing retirement security for people in this province, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and we're working with businesses to make sure that we continue to be the number one jurisdiction for foreign direct Thank investment, you. Mr. Speaker. That's our Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, not a single nurse or doctor in the province believes this government isn't right. cutting health care. Right. Right. Ontario Shores Mental Health Sciences Centre is a unique facility that offers mental health services to the entire province, yet Ontario Shores is now preparing for its fifth straight budget freeze. Mr. Speaker, one in three people struggling with mental health issues are not receiving the care they need and deserve in our province. In fact, the PTSD support wait list is almost a year long at that facility. In any other area of health, that would be unacceptable. Just last month, many from across the aisle tweeted and texted their support on Bell Let's Talk Day. So why won't the government put their money where their mouths are? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, why isn't the Premier supporting Ontario Question. Shores and other mental health facilities in this province to the level that patients deserve? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Well, again, I will just say that the uh, investments that we are making in health, including, Mr. Speaker, the $138 million more for mental health that was in our uh, 2015 budget, Mr. Speaker, the, in the increases that we have made across the board in health care, Mr. Speaker, which amount to a 53% increase in health care funding, Mr. Speaker, since 2003, year over year increases in health care, which will continue, I will say, Mr. Speaker. All of that is within the context of our initiatives to grow our economy, Mr. Speaker. You know, we know, we know that there is a national and, in fact, an international concern about the economy. We're very pleased that Ontario is leading Canada's economy, Mr. Speaker. We are the leading jurisdiction in terms terms of growth, and that is because, Mr. Speaker, we are making the investments that we know Answer. are necessary now and are needed for future prosperity. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and I, I appreciate the talking points, but I'm going to ask a very specific question about Ontario Shores. The loss of 25 Order. staff at Ontario Shores is having a devastating impact on the entire region. Their outpatient women's consultation service providing treatment for critical postpartum depression can only operate one day a week now. The geriatric memory clinic and traumatic stress clinic are facing record waiting lists. The Premier says she is committed to giving first responders quicker access to treatment of PTSD, but then she cuts funding to important facilities like Ontario Shores. Mr. Speaker, when will the Premier admit that she's forcing mothers, seniors, and mental health patients of our province to pay for their, sca their scandals, their mismanagement? Because of your scandals, you're Question. cutting mental health in the province of Ontario. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? 
Thank you. Bring her. On to care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the truth is that we actually spend more than $3 billion a year in this province on mental health and addictions. And it's always more complicated than the Leader of the Opposition sure would like is. to portray it, because of those positions, he hasn't mentioned, in fact, that 33 new positions are being created. He hasn't mentioned, as well, that those and other vacancies will be made available to the individuals that he referenced earlier. He hasn't mentioned that, that, that those decisions were made after a, a substantial and comprehensive review, planning, uh, process in, included best practices, clinical practices, engagement, and consultations with the community. And part of the solution, as well, which I would hope the leader of the opposition would support, is where science has has demonstrated and the outcomes prove that it's often better to care for people in the community. Community resources are provided. We're doubling the Answer. funding. We have doubled the funding in that Lynn for community supports and mental health. Thank you. New question. Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The Premier knows I've always said there's no monopoly on a good idea. That's why I applaud Order. this government's recent decision to help protect the mental health of Ontario's first responders. Our first responders play a crucial role in protecting the public's safety and well-being. Unfortunately, the government's announcement does little to help those already facing serious and deliberating challenges of PTSD. Many of Ontario's first responders who have been diagnosed Deputy with PTSD House have had their claims rejected by the Workplace Safety and Assurance Board. A fix to that problem exists from the member of Parkdale High Park's bill, which would extend PTSD to first responders. Mr. Speaker, why won't this government fast track Bill 2 and get our first responders the help they deserve? Question. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Labour is going to want to uh, comment on this, but we recognize that PTSD is a significant risk, Mr. Speaker. We understand that it is a huge challenge for, for people who are living in these dangerous situations in, uh, in their work every single day, Mr. Speaker, which is why we're bringing legislation forward, which is why we understand that prevention has to be part of those initiatives, Mr. Speaker, and we also understand that we need to work on what the presumptive component of that uh, of that initiative would be. So we understand both parts of this, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Labour is working uh, with the with the uh, first responders, with the community, Mr. Speaker, to come up with the right initiatives. But, Mr. Speaker, we know there has to be both. There has to be prevention, and we have to work on what the presumptive uh, component of the legislation would be. That's right. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, it has now been 155 days since I asked this government to act on Bill 2. In those 155 days, I have heard from countless firefighters, police officers and paramedics who need this government's help. That's 155 days that the government has turned its back on our first responders. The minister claims there is legislation coming, but Bill 2 has been sitting on the order paper for 244 days. Mr. Speaker, why won't the Premier do the right thing? What is stopping from the Premier of passing Bill 2 other than simply you don't like it because it's an NDP bill? It is the right thing to do. Yeah. Do it. Thank you. Premier? Well, Mr. Speaker, because it's inadequate. It's an, ad an inadequate piece of legislation. It is, it is not sufficient in and of itself, Mr. Speaker. It needs to be broadened. It needs to be a The member from Prince Edward Hastings will withdraw. Withdraw. It's not that it's wrong, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the core of the issue, the core of the issue is there. But, Mr. Speaker, we have been working. The Minister of Labour has been very, very clear that we understand and we we have are building on work that we have been doing with first responders for years, Mr. Speaker. We are the government that has brought in presumptive legislation for cancers, Mr. Speaker, and we've added we've added diseases to that uh, presumptive legislation. We know that PTSD is important. We're bringing in legislation, Mr. Speaker. It will be broader than Bill 2, Answer. which is a good start, and we need to get it right, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, we cannot afford to wait another 244 days. Police, 
paramedics and firefighters, our province's first responders, are twice as likely to suffer from PTSD as anybody else. Just a month and a half into 2016, Canada has already lost 10 first responders to PTSD. Mr. Speaker, why is this government waiting so long to take action on this important topic. If there is problems that bill amend it, what you're actually doing is you're shrinking the scope. You are doing less, you're delaying, you're dithering. Do the right thing. Order. Order. Minister Labor. Minister Labor. Thank you, Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise in the House and address this question because it is a very, very important uh, question, Speaker. And I think it's one that everybody in this House understands that the people that are on the front lines deserve the best from the Government of Ontario. That's exactly what we're doing. The Premier has asked me to bring forward a comprehensive approach that exactly. looks at preventing people from getting PTSD in the first Not place and for lately. those people that get PTSD yeah. to make sure they get early identification, early intervention, and early Early treatment, Speaker. Bill 2 is not good enough for the first responders in this province. It's a good start. We need to go much further than that, Speaker. When we do move ahead on this, Speaker, I believe that Ontario is going to become a leader in this regard, and that's what I want to see. And I will note, in the history of civilization, the PC party has raised this issue three times. Oh! And now all of a sudden they're the champion of PTSD. Be seated, please. Be Order, please. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to start by um, wishing everybody a happy first day of session. Welcome back to the House. Uh, New Democrats are listening to uh, Ontarian Speaker, and this is what we're hearing. For most people, life is getting harder. This is to the Premier Speaker. Families are struggling, and now the Liberals are making deep cuts to health care. Ask any nurse or doctor and they'll tell you exactly how these Liberal cuts are hurting patients. It means longer wait times for senior speaker, fewer nurses in our hospitals, and even more worry for families. Why is this Premier cutting health care when she knows that these cuts are hurting Ontarians? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, once again, let me just say that year over year, we are increasing health care funding yep. every we single year, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. We will continue to do that. We will continue, Mr. Speaker, to support the health care system. As it goes through a transformation, Mr. Speaker, we will increase funding in terms of community supports. We are increasing in funding in terms of uh, mental health, Mr. Speaker. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, that we are in the midst of a health care transformation, which is part of which is part of an economic growth, Mr. Speaker, that is, uh, is incredibly important for the people of this province going forward. If we don't make the investments in people and in, in their skills and their talents, in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, including health care infrastructure, if we don't make those investments now, we won't have Answer. the prosperity that we know we need going forward. So that's why our plan is working, including increases in health care funding, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier should know what's happening in Ontario. People are waiting 200 days or more for the home care that they need. Thousands upon thousands of seniors are stuck waiting for a long-term care bed. And the Liberals' freeze on hospital budgets has forced hospitals to cut nearly 1,200 registered nursing jobs in just over a year. Patients are suffering because of Liberal cuts, but the Premier will not even acknowledge it, Speaker. She's more focused on helping her small group of friends profit off the sale of Hydro One, Speaker. It begs the question, why does this Premier think that private profits are more important than patient care? 
Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Here's, here's what I think is critical. I think the $270 million that we put into home care, Mr. Speaker, home and community care in the 2015 budget, the $4.2 million for physiotherapy, Mr. Speaker, the $138 million that we put into mental health care, Mr. Speaker, in the 2015 budget. And I would ask the, uh, the leader of the third party, when the budget uh, comes out in the, in the near future, that she look at the increases to health care funding that will be in that budget, Mr. Speaker. We know how critical health care is to people in this province. We know, with an aging population, how critical it is that we get that care right, Mr. Speaker, because there are families who are struggling with, uh, with their elderly loved ones who are looking for the right kind of care. They are, they are looking, they may be looking for long-term care, they may be looking for uh, home care, Mr. Speaker. Answer. And we need to make sure that we make those investments in order to provide that care for people across the province. Thank you. That's what we're doing. Well, so Mr. Speaker, I would urge this Premier to listen to Ontarians in their consultation on the budget and stop the further sell-off of high That's what I would urge this Premier to do. But it's like this Premier doesn't know what's happening in Ontario, Speaker. It's like she doesn't know that the start of January, hospitals have cut hundreds of frontline health care workers in Windsor, in Hamilton, in Waterloo, in Sarnia. It's like she doesn't think about those patients, Speaker, who have waited months and months for surgery and are forced to watch helplessly as this government cuts the health care system. I try to put myself in their shoes, Speaker. It must be the most discouraging, frustrating, and painful experience. Will this Premier take just a moment, Speaker, just a moment to think about those patients who are waiting for care and tell Question. them why she thinks that they should wait even longer? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, the, the leader of the third party uh, asks that we listen to the people of Ontario, which we do, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I, know that the, I know that the leader of the third party understands that even in a narrow way, uh, in terms of the, uh, the budget, because we listen on all sorts of subjects, Mr. Speaker, but in terms of budget consultations, we have talked to thousands of people across the province, Mr. Speaker, face-to-face, -face, online. We have heard those voices, Mr. Speaker. We understand that there are concerns, and Mr. Speaker, those voices will be reflected in the budget that we bring forward. I think that the, uh, the other reality is that the leader of the third party doesn't talk about the other part of the equation. She talks about where there are challenges, but she doesn't talk about, for example, the three hospitals, uh, Aurelia Soldiers Memorial, Hamilton Health yes, Services, sir. Ottawa Hospital, who are all advertising positions, Mr. Speaker, who are looking for nurses to hire, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. That's the other part of the equation. New question, the leader of the third party. This question is also for the Premier. For most Ontarians, Speaker, life is getting harder, and this government just isn't helping. People are looking for good jobs that actually pay the bill, Speaker. Too many Ontarians find it harder than ever to get decent work and good paychecks. But rather than helping people, we see Liberals facing criminal charges for their conduct and a Premier who's more focused on helping private investors profit from the sale of Hydro One. Why does this Premier not share the priorities of the people of this province? Mr. Speaker, I am acutely aware, acutely aware of the concerns that people have about the economy in this country and the economy globally. I know, Mr. Speaker, that people are concerned about the future, which is exactly why, Mr. Speaker, we are making the investments that we are making. It is exactly why our plan is designed to make sure that we do everything in our power to work with businesses like Chrysler, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that there are more jobs created in Ontario rather than fewer. It's exactly why we are moving on retirement and security, Mr. Mr. Speaker, so that people can look forward to a retirement that is secure. It is exactly why we are investing in people's talent and skills, and it is exactly why we're investing in infrastructure that is creating 110,000 jobs yes, a year, Mr. Speaker, right now, and economic growth into the future. That's why our plan is designed the way it is. Well, Speaker, here's what's happening in the Ontario that the Premier doesn't think about. Fewer than half, fewer than half, Speaker, of all workers in the GTHA are in permanent full-time jobs. Fewer than half.
Windsor has the highest unemployment rate in the country for five months and counting. And families feel like there are two different worlds in this province. There's an Ontario where the Premier protects her friends and insiders, and then there's one for the rest of us, where families simply cannot keep up. Minister of Why Economic is this Premier Development. so far out of touch with the real priorities of Ontarians? Thank you, Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, Again, I will say to the leader of the third party, there is no doubt that there are uh, concerns about the national economy. I understand that. I understand that we are in a challenging time as a country. But the reality is that Ontario is leading growth in this country, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that our uh, our unemployment rate, Mr. Speaker, is below the national average. There are 600,000 net new jobs that have been created since 2008-2009, including more than 40,000 over the last couple of months, Mr. Speaker, in Ontario. So the fact is that we are doing everything in our power, and it is working, Mr. Speaker, to keep Ontario on that track, to keep Ontario as a leader. It is it is our responsibility, given our diverse economy, given what's happening across the Answer. country, that we. Stay Stay as strong and grow as much as we can, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly what Thank we're you. doing. Yeah. Well, Speaker, when the Premier boasts of opportunity and growth, most Ontarians have one question, Speaker, and that is for whom? Who is really getting ahead here in Ontario? It's not the men and women who are out of work and too young to retire but too old to start over. It's not uh, the 300,000 families, Speaker, who have lost their good manufacturing jobs in this province, and it's certainly not young people, Speaker, who are stuck with an unemployment rate well above the national average. They want to know, Speaker. Those folks want to know why isn't this premier working for them? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, given, the, uh, given the, the rhetoric of the leader of the third party, I would think she'd be very supportive of the initiatives that we have taken, Mr. Yes. Speaker, that are bearing fruit. So she'd be supportive of the uh, $565 million in youth employment funding that we've put in place, which has found thousands of young people placements, Mr. Speaker. She'd be supportive of Experience Ontario, where young people across the country are having an opportunity to have a work experience, Mr. Speaker, that would lead to post-secondary education. She would be supported, Mr. Speaker, of the partnerships with business that have made us the number one jurisdiction for foreign direct investment. And that's a, you know, that's a statistic, Mr. Speaker, but the reality is that means jobs. That means jobs created here across the province. So, Mr. Speaker, I would expect that the leader of the third party would support all of those things Answer. and, as the leader of the NDP, that she would support the investments in infrastructure that are creating 110,000 jobs every year. Your question, the member from Terry Salmon Stoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question for you to the Premier. It's an important Premier, one. the Nipigon Bridge is a key asset to the province of Ontario. In December, I was able to drive across it with PC leader Patrick Brown. Little did we know that at the time that the two lanes of the bridge would only be operating for less than a month. When the Nipigon Bridge failed on January 11th, the only detour available was through the United States. Today, people wishing to cross it still face delays to use the single lane that is safe to travel. Safe winter roads and reliable infrastructure are absolute necessities to the economy of Northern Ontario. The people of Nipigon have a right to know, can't this Liberal government get anything right? No. No. Speaker, how is it possible that under the watch of this government, such a key piece of brand new infrastructure was allowed to fail? Question. Thank you. Transportation. Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I uh, thank the member opposite for the question. First, Speaker, let me uh, let me take just a quick moment to actually acknowledge the leadership shown by the Minister of Northern Development and Mines, yeah. who also happens to be the local MPP for this community. Uh, from the very from the very day that this incident took place, Speaker, that member has actually shown tremendous local leadership. Speaker, I also want to acknowledge that all of the communities in the area, from Nipigon to Marathon to our 
to our First Nations partners in the area, speaker that I've had the chance to meet with directly, have all been exceptionally patient and understanding, and we work closely with them and will continue to do that, Speaker. What I've said and what the Minister of Northern Development and Mines has said is that we anticipate before the end of February, by the end of February, the second lane of traffic will be reopened on this bridge. It's important for us to make sure, Speaker, that we do get to the bottom of what took place, that we provide accurate information to the public, and that we get that bridge Answer. reopened and operating safely as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Again, uh, to the Premier, Speaker, the Nipigon Bridge is as critical a piece of infrastructure as we have in Ontario. It is the single link that connects the Trans-Canada Highway. It is estimated that over $100 million of goods travel across the Nipigon Bridge each day. Uncertainty of travel times is slowing this flow of goods to market as a negative impact on the northern economy and the, ultimately the entire province. Mr. Speaker, the construction of the Nipigon Bridge has already been estimated to cost $106 million, and the bridge failure will only add to the cost. <clears throat> the government has promised that the two lanes of the Nipigon Bridge will be reopened by the end of February. So my question, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier meet this deadline, or is it simply another stretch goal of this government? Good question. Well, Speaker, uh, thanks very much. I'll, I'll reiterate at the beginning of this answer, as I said in my original answer, that we do anticipate uh, that the bridge will be reopened. The second lane of traffic will be reopened uh, by the end of February, Speaker. But, but you know what I can't help finding curious from that member and that question, Speaker, specifically, is that he seems to not remember that over the last 12 or 13 years, we are the government that's invested $1.9 billion to four-lane highways in Northern Ontario, Speaker. And that in my speaker, that in my three years in this legislature, year after year, as we included more money to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars for highways in northern Ontario, that member, that party have consistently voted against the budgets that have delivered strong futures for the people of the North Speaker. We're going to get the bridge reopened, and this year you should join with us to support a budget that will build this province up, Speaker. You say that, please? Thank you. The uh, <coughs> member's taking a chance. New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Speaker, thank you. My question to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Climate change is one of the most important and far-reaching issues facing this planet. But by selling Hydro One, this government is making it more difficult for Ontario to take action on climate change. Hydro One is moving into the hands of private owners. They have no interest in conservation, since they make more profit when people use more electricity, not less. Hydro One is now moving into the hands of private owners who have no interest in upgrading the grid and connecting to renewable energy sources unless they're guaranteed fat profit and zero risk. Why, why is the government making climate change action more difficult by selling off hydro? Question. Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm always amazed at the ability for the NDP to spend money but never tell us where it's coming from, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Trees, it grows so you may, you may have noticed, Mr. Speaker, that we, we're moving forward with a carbon market and a price on carbon, but we don't have that revenue yet, Mr. Speaker. So we just committed to a major home retrofit program to help people reduce their heating costs and cooling costs and create jobs, a major electric vehicle subsidy program, electric charging program. Well, that money didn't come from pixie dust and fair Order. speaker. It actually came from trying to manage out of the difficult recession without increasing the tax burden and reducing services. So broadening ownership of part of a utility, which is terrifyingly ideologically framed for that party, but is Answer. in the world of most people a pragmatic solution to finding money to create jobs and build our economy, Mr. Speaker. And but I'd be happy in the supplementary to elaborate further. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I guess the minister didn't want to answer that question, so I'll go to the second part. Germany privatized much of its transmission grid in the 1990s, and now Germany realizes that they made a huge mistake. 
They now realize that if they're to move towards a low-carbon, renewably-powered economy, that the public needs to own and control the grid. The government has often looked to Germany for lessons from its renewable energy transition. Will the government learn from Germany's great mistake and stop the further privatization of Hydro One? Thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Germany is closing 11 nuclear plants right now, and I don't think we would do that given the implications that they've got coal coming back online. So I don't think we need to take lessons from Germany. But you know, Mr. Speaker, one of the things this government realizes is that the world is changing at a very fast rate. You can go to Barry uh, in my, my, my friend uh, uh, MPP Hogarth's writing, and we were out there the other day. People are now buying homes with batteries, with inverters, with ground source heat pumps, with solars and computers, and they're buying that because they're net zero. And they're actually called prosumers. They actually generate more revenue. One of the challenges for government is going to be managing those old industrial assets that we have to for another 30, 40 years. We have to get more life out of them. We have to look at new and innovative ways to get revenues from assets that are quite frankly, in some cases, we're going to be less demand for and put them into assets like Answer. transit and other things of which there'll be greater demand for, Mr. Speaker. To most Ontarians, I think that's a sensible approach. It certainly seems to be to this government. Thank you. Any question, the member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the minister responsible for the anti-racism directorate. Members of this House know that the anti-racism directorate was eliminated by the Progressive Conservatives in 1995, Mr. Speaker. Over a decade later, I'm proud to be part of a government reinstating the Ontario Anti-Racism Directorate. Canada and Ontario have long been bastions for principles like acceptance and like equality. While these values remain at the core of our cult cultural identity, the reinstatement of the Anti-Racism Directorate by our government indicates our commitment to remove the social and economic barriers inhibiting true equality. I would like to ask the minister responsible for the anti-racism directorate to inform this house on why the new directorate was created. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, thank the member from Scarborough Rouge River for the uh, question and also thank the Premier for uh, entrusting me with this responsibility that I take quite seriously. As every member of this House is aware, individual, systematic and cultural racism continues to create unfair outcomes for racial minorities in Ontario. And the time has come, Mr. Speaker, to remove social and economic barriers that prevent our province from achieving true equity. In order to address racism in all forms, our government is creating a new anti-racism secretariat, and by creating this new directorate, directorate, our government is demonstrating its commitment to building an inclusive province where everyone, regardless of their race, ethnicity, or cultural background, has an equal opportunity to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister. Under no circumstance should an individual's social status or economic potential be defined by the color of their skin, their ethnicity, or cultural heritage. Mr. Speaker, I wholeheartedly support the creation of the Anti-Racism Directorate and the objective articulated by the Minister. With Canada's population growth rate below replacement levels and our continued expansion dependent on immigration, achieving true equality is even more important. Mr. Speaker, as a member of this legislature and a diverse Canadian, I believe that this anti-racism directorate is an important next step for Ontario. With that in mind, I would like to ask the minister responsible for the anti-racism directorate how the directorate will go about achieving Question. objectives. Thank you. Minister. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and again, thanks, thank you to the member from Scarborough's River uh, for the follow-up question. I know he's a, a strong supporter of equity here in the province of Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the anti-racism uh, directorate's aim is to increase public awareness um, um, uh, and awareness around racism by creating a more inclusive province. 
and to apply an anti-racism lens in developing, implementing, implementing and evaluating government policies, programs and services. This newly established directorate will achieve this uh, by working with key partners from education, community-based organizations, different institutions and, of course, the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker racism continues to create unfair uh, outcomes for racial minorities here in Ontario, and by creating this new directorate, our government is building an inclusive province where everyone has the equal Answer. opportunity to succeed and do well and to build the province that we all aspire to become. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question, the member from Kitchener, Yes, uh, well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the latest Metrolinx numbers have revealed that the near-empty UP Ghost Express has become even emptier. 170 seat trains rolling with less than six passengers. Wow. 2,200 a day in December, well short of the 5,000 goal. All the while, we foot the bill for botched fare setting that was designed to pay for the unnecessary luxury terminal to train boutique access this government insisted on. Speaker, every day that the trains get emptier, the costs grow larger. And until the fares are lowered, people will take the more economical, accessible Uber option. Speaker, she's seen the numbers. Will the Premier tell us when she will move past assessment and discussion to actually act? Good question. Thank you, Premier. Station. Sir, Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member opposite for the question. Over the last number of days, uh, both myself and the Premier uh, and others at Metrolinx have discussed this very topic, Speaker. We've all said publicly, in fact, just last week, we said publicly that we are currently analyzing the entire situation. We're looking at every option, Speaker. Uh, we understand that the ridership needs to come up. What we've seen this past weekend, of course, Speaker, is that there is a great deal of curiosity and interest uh, and support for this particular service as it relates to linking Union and Pearson, Speaker, but also as it relates to providing more service or transit options for people in the West End of Toronto. So over the coming days, Speaker, we'll continue to, to, to conduct this analysis. We'll complete that work and we'll respond accordingly as soon as we're ready, Speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supplementary. Now, Speaker, when we asked the uh, government to take a look at the fare reductions, uh, I didn't think he'd actually take me up and make them for free. However, it's not just the UP Express. Last month, we were stunned to learn that this government oversaw plans for a $250 million Union Station train shed renovation and forgot to make sure their promised electric trains actually oh, fit. I mean, how can you approve a plan for a quarter Sounds billion like dollar train rich. shed renovation and neglect to ensure that the trains actually fit in the shed? Little glitch. Speaker, this is a classic Liberal plan. Spend first, ask questions later, steam rolling ahead with transit photo ops without concern for cost overruns and logistical challenges. This is a project that's already 25% over initial cost estimates. Wow. Will the Premier tell us how much You're more it will cost garden. to actually get her electric truck in yeah. the shed? Uh, Good question. Thank you. Minister. Thanks very, thanks very much, Speaker. Of course, the team at Metrolinx, working closely with the Ministry of Transportation, has a plan over the next decade to literally transform the GO network, Speaker. That member, representing uh, the uh, part of the province that he represents, will be well aware that we made a commitment over the next decade to take uh, the existing GO service, which is extremely popular and well used, Speaker, and transform that into two way, all day GO service with electrification on core segments and trains running at inter intervals of up to 15 minutes on those core segments, Speaker. As part of that plan, uh, we are increasing capacity at Union Station, Speaker. But as I said to the member from Perry Sound in his earlier question, what I find remarkable is that witnessing that member in that caucus repeatedly, Speaker, vote against every undertaking from this government and this premier to invest in more infrastructure to deliver more transit. They've opposed it, and now they're complaining that we're not delivering fast enough, notwithstanding their opposition, Speaker. Thank Maybe you. they can get their story straight. Thank you. New questions? The member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. After having travelled uh, across the province over the last month for pre-budget consultations, it has become increasingly clear to New, New Democrats that Ontario is divided. We heard some heartbreaking and painful experiences from the people of this province. On the one hand, there is an Ontario where a small group of powerful insiders who have the ear of the Premier are flourishing. Then there's the rest of Ontarians who are struggling to keep up. They're worried about finding good jobs. They're worried about keeping good jobs and retiring from good jobs. 
Premier, what does this government have to say to Ontario's youth who are struggling to find work, to people who are working three jobs to make ends meet, to people whose jobs are at risk after a lifetime of service? Well, Mr. Speaker, what I would say to people who are uh, in those situations, who are struggling, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, I understand that this is a challenging time. As I've said before, Mr. Speaker, it's a challenging time in the national economy. Uh, Ontario is leading that economy, though, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is leading in this country in terms of job creation, Mr. Speaker, in terms of foreign direct investment, which leads to jobs, in terms of investment, Mr. Speaker, which is creating jobs. So we are doing everything in our power. To to increase the growth in the province, Mr. Speaker, to stay as a leader in the country, Mr. Speaker. It is our responsibility as the largest province in the country, the most diverse economy in the country, to be strong, Mr. Speaker, particularly when there are other economies that are struggling. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, our investments in infrastructure, Answer. in people's talent and skills, in their retirement security, and I'm working with business, is working. We are creating jobs, Mr. Speaker, Thank working you. together. We will continue to do that. Uh, Premier, the pre-budget consultations have been a stark reminder that the gap between those that are doing well and th those are who are falling behind is only getting wider. St. Catharines, Niagara and Sudbury have unemployment rates of 8.6, two points above the provincial average. Windsor's unemployment rate is 9.3 per cent, the highest in Canada. Windsor also has the highest youth unemployment rate in the country for the last five months and counting. These are not rates that warrant bragging rights. Unlike this government, New Democrats are listening to families, to students and to seniors, and they're saying that good jobs are hard to, hard to find and hard to keep. Premier, what does this government have to say to the thousands of Ontarians that are unemployed, underemployed, and precariously employed under the Liberal watch? Thank you, Premier. Yeah, and I would say to the, uh, to the member opposite that I'm sure that she uh, has listened with interest then as we have announced, as Chrysler announced, more jobs in Windsor than expected, Mr. Speaker. That as she has heard the job numbers over the last couple of months, Mr. Speaker, with net new jobs of more than 40,000, Mr. Speaker, and the vast majority of those are full-time jobs, Mr. Speaker. So I know that the member opposite is paying attention to those. I, and in terms of listening to the people in the province, Mr. Speaker, so we did uh, pre-budget consultations across the province. Nine weeks of engagement of in-person, online, written uh, and telephone uh, engagement, Mr. Speaker. 20 in-person consultations in 12 cities. Heard from 700 people, Mr. Speaker. So there are thousands of people from around the province from whom we have heard, Mr. Speaker, and we have yes, heard their concerns. Their concerns will be reflected in the budget. And the fact is, Mr. Speaker, the plan we've put in place, working with the private sector, because Thank government you. doesn't create jobs, it's working. Thank you. New question: The member from Halton. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and International Trade. Speaker, international markets play a critical role in the growth of Ontario's economy. Trade missions are the best way for us to connect Ontario businesses with the international market. To boost Ontario's economy, we must attract new investments, facilitate partnerships and help businesses export globally. Speaker, the Premier and Ministers have organized and led a number of international trade missions to do just that. In 2014, the Premier and Minister's mission to China secured $1 billion in investments and 1,400 jobs for Ontarians. Last year, another mission secured an additional $2.5 billion and 1,700 jobs. Speaker, in January, the Premier departed for the first trade mission of 2016 to India. Would the, will the minister, Question. Could the minister, could the minister please tell us about that mission and what it will mean for Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, for the question. I want to thank the Honourable Member for asking. <laughs> uh, Speaker, early this month, the Premier led a very successful trade mission to India. This trade mission led us to cities like New Delhi, Kandagarh, Hyderabad, and Mumbai, drew on Ontario's expertise in sustainable development and urban infrastructure. Yeah. Speaker, we were able to have variable meetings with key Indian officials, leaders, including, including the Prime Minister of India, Prime Minister Modi, which will help strengthen our economic ties with states and businesses. 
Speaker, we signed 65 new agreements between businesses and institutions from Ontario and India, where we add 240 million, creating more than 150 jobs in Ontario. Premier will Thank you. also sign MOUs with five Indian states. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. It is so good to see our government and our business and institutional stakeholders taking our going global challenge so seriously. Our natural links to India and the goodwill built up in this mission will improve the trade and investment relationship between India and Ontario in the future. A number of the MOUs appear to involve investments and opportunities for global growth for Ontario businesses and jobs here in Ontario. With 700,000 Indo-Canadians residing in Ontario, we should be building stronger ties with India's business community. India may now be the fastest growing economy in the world, and it's time for us to invest and reach out to that emerging economic power. Minister, can you tell this legislature how this mission will build a stronger Question. business relationship between Ontario and India? Yeah. Minister. The Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of International Trade outlined some of the successful outcomes achieved on this trip in terms of MOUs and investments landed, and that's all extremely important. But also important, Mr. Speaker, are the opportunities to build stronger relationships with Indian businesses that will, will, will result in even more future investments and jobs. We met with numerous influential Indian companies, including Essel, Tata, Tech Mahendra, Mitra, Birla, Hero Motorsports, High Tech Industries, ICICI Bank, and PayTN, among many others, Mr. Speaker. We identified many opportunities for future collaboration, investment, and partnerships. And we went to bat, Mr. Speaker, for Ontario companies and communities, from Novo Plastics in Markham, Ontario, to Data Wind in Mississauga. They landed significant opportunities, demonstrating how successful Ontario companies can be when they go global. Answer. This mission was very successful, and I look forward to following up on the many leads that we identified. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Question, the member from Lionel, Cormac, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. After the events this past week of two violent domestic assaults resulting in the death of four people, and severe injuries to a fifth in Odessa, Odessa and Elmont, and the three murders of women last fall in Renfrew County, the public is acutely aware that there are grave shortcomings and a failure by police, our correctional institutions, and our courts' ability to protect women and their families from domestic violence. However, the many numerous recommendations by my colleagues from Halliburton, Kawartha, Lakes Brock, and Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke have fallen on the deaf ears and the idle hands of this government. Speaker, the government is failing to protect women and their families from domestic violence. But the public wants to know, what my caucus wants to know, Question. and what I want to know is why. Thank you. <laughs> Minister? The Minister responsible for women. The Minister responsible for women. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for raising this very important question. Violence against women is indeed a very serious problem, should never be tolerated in Ontario or elsewhere, and uh, this is a huge priority for me, Speaker, as a minister responsible for women's issues. That's why our government continues to take concrete action to make the province safer for women. I am aware of the cases that the member has raised, and uh, working very closely with my colleague, the Minister of Community Services and Correctional Services. Uh, there's a number of investments being made, not just in our, our two ministries, but also with the Attorney General and other uh, ministries, to take a coordinated approach to our response. Our annual funding to combat, combat gender-based violence is approximately $456 million uh, a year, Speaker. That includes many uh, initiatives, not the least of which is our sexual violence and uh, harassment action plan that was launched last year with Answer. the leadership of our Premier. We're acting on uh, legislative and uh, program support pro uh, initiatives uh, associated with that. Thank and you. We'll take it very seriously. Thank you. Speaker, back to the Minister of Correctional Services. Speaker, many of those guilty of domestic violence are sentenced to serve with a recommendation to serve their sentence 
in specialized treatment facilities for mental health and addictions in order to rehabilitate their violent behavior. However, there are often no vacancies in these facilities, and the offenders are placed in general population, not getting the treatment they need nor what the courts have ordered. While the court is expecting rehabilitation, in reality, this seldom happens. Speaker, our courts and our jails are failing each other and failing the people of Ontario. When will both our recommendations and those of the courts not be viewed with contempt and no longer fall on deaf ears and idle hands, but be heeded by this government? Question. Thank you. Question. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate, again, the member raising the important issue, specifically around domestic uh, violence. And uh, our Ontario Women's Directorate has implemented many initiatives to raise awareness and provide uh, supports for victims. This has been going on since 2004, Speaker. We have many uh, programs and uh, policies in response to that. We have training of uh, frontline professionals. We have public education campaigns, and uh, we have the employment training for abused and at-risk women. Uh, we have a language interpreter uh, program speaker. Uh, but as my colleague, the Minister of uh, Correctional Community and Correctional Services has raised before, we are working very closely with our partners in policing and the Attorney General to look Answer. at uh, domestic violence, to look at uh, what happens when someone uh, is released from offence and uh, what that means to the community. And I'll be happy to follow up with the member directly uh, further. Thank you. New question, the member from Timmins, James Bate. My uh, question is to the Premier. Premier, top Liberals insiders are presently before the courts facing various criminal charges for their roles in both the gas plant scandal and the Sudbury by-election. That's now multiple police investigations into the Liberals' wrongdoing connected to your office, the office of the Premier. My question is, is this a record that you're proud of? Thank you, Premier. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I know that the government house leader is going to want to uh, say something on this uh, on this front, but I will just say that uh, the circumstances around the event, um, the investigation concerned events that uh, took place before I was the premier. I think the member knows that, Mr. Speaker. There is a matter before the courts. It would be inappropriate for me to say uh, more at this point, so I will not, Mr. Speaker. Yep. Two supplementary. Well, I thought the question was pretty straightforward. It was, is are you proud of that record? At the end of the day, you're the Premier of Ontario, you're responsible to that office, and I asked you a question, and obviously you decided not to answer it. Let me ask you this. Are you going to be uh, forthcoming and, uh, and working with whomever, the police, the courts, whoever it is, in order to get to the bottom of these things and be fully cooperative in the investigation of these matters? Yes or no? Thank you, Premier. Well, Speaker, uh, again, um, I, I'm, I'm surprised that the first day back in the legislature, the member office is not spending time talk, spending time talking about issues that are important to Ontarians, no, but to Musling himself uh, right now. Speaker, he very much is aware that these issues are Order. the course, and any interference yep. from oh, this no, House no, will be highly inappropriate. What, Speaker, I want to tell, uh, talk about is how proud we are of the work that the Premier is doing when it comes to building Ontario up, when it comes to making sure that we're making historical investments in our infrastructure in every single community in a riding, by making sure that our health care continues to get better and better, and our seniors are getting better health care in our communities. That education system, uh, Speaker, in this province, Finish, please. Our education system, uh, Speaker, in this province is one of the best in the world. Of course, those are good things, and the member opposite does not want to talk about those. So, of course, what he Answer. does is trying to talk about a court Answer. case, Answer. which he knows that uh, we should not be discussing in this house. I ask him, Speaker, that we should focus on issues at hand to sure. build a stronger uh, economy in our province. Thank you. New question. The member from Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sports and the newly appointed Minister responsible for the Anti-Racism Secretariat. Today, the Minister will be bringing a bill before the House to proclaim Black History Month in perpetuity. While Ontario was the first jurisdiction in Canada to proclaim Black History Month, our government did so annually 
by passing the proclamation through, through cabinet. We have a significant legacy of black history here in Ontario, a legacy, legacy that deserves to be celebrated and enshrined into law. Could the minister please inform the members of this house why Black History Month is so important and deserve our support? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Durham uh, for the question. Ontario first proclaimed uh, February's Black History Month back in 1993, and it was an important year because it marked the 200th anniversary of a law banning the importation of slaves into Upper Canada, wow. a motion enacted into law by our province's first lieutenant governor. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, this is one of the first signs uh, of a pathway that Canada would be uh, formally recognized as a very progressive, uh, culturally diverse multiculture and, and, and a place that's built on equity. These values are important to our identity as Canadian and as Ontarians, centuries later, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if this legislation is passed, it will proclaim February's Black History Month and it will ensure that Ontarians have an opportunity to reflect on the contributions of black men and women here in the province of Ontario, uh, black Canadian history, Mr. Speaker, Ontario's history. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. Ontario and Canada have always been active on the global stage in recognizing human rights and denouncing, denouncing racism and inequality. Ontario was a beacon of hope to American slaves seeking freedom and the final destination of over 30,000 slaves who, who transversed the Underground Railroad. We honor international figures who further who for the equality, like the late Nelson Mandela, the first living person awarded honorary Canadian citizenship and a member and order of Canada. Could the minister responsible for the anti-racism secretariat please highlight the legacy left by our black forebears? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank the member for the uh, follow-up question. I think it's important for us to recognize the contribution of black Canadians uh, here in the legislature and throughout Ontario. Uh, Ontarians like uh, Leonard Brathwaite, uh, MPP, uh, who served uh, in this legislature and uh, was a civil rights uh, ac uh, advocate, and um, he, uh, he fought really to ensure that uh, equality was brought forward for all people here in Ontario. Uh, people like Charlie Roach, a human rights activist and a lawyer here in Ontario, and of course, Mr. Speaker, uh, Marianne Shad, the first female black publisher, and I believe the first female publisher in Ontario Alvin when she, Curling. when she, and of course, Alvin Curling, uh, one of our, uh, our many friends of many people in the legislature here. Mr. Speaker, it is important for us to remember and to continue to celebrate the contributions of black Ontarians, black Canadians here in Ontario, and I'm very proud that this legislation will allow all of us here in the legislature to do, do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. The question, the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. The Minister is well aware of the impact his health cuts are having around Ontario. My riding in Simcoe North will continue to feel the, feel the Minister's health cuts if he doesn't stop them. The proposed $5.2 million in cuts to Georgian Bay General Hospital are atrocious. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are cutting funding to medium-sized hospitals across Ontario. They are eliminating, at Georgian Bay General, top-level services like emergency room care and completely wiping out obstetrics. Mr. Speaker, is the minister going to turn his back on the residents of Simcoe North and cut these essential services? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the, the Leader of the Opposition knows full well that uh, no decisions have been taken by the hospital. First of all, that there was a report as a result of a uh, process, which was an open and public uh, process that involved community consultation and involvement of the local Lynn as well, and of course the hospital, that made a series of recommendations that would ensure uh, sustainability of that hospital and the highest quality of care going into the future. Those recommendations were received by the hospital in December. There had been no decisions by the hospital. There had been no decisions by the Lynn. There had been no decisions by the ministry. But I do know that the, uh, the leader of the opposition did, prior to in fact making uh, any effort to sit down and meet with the hospital to get a fully un full understanding of the situation, did go out into the public domain, raise a lot of anxiety, suggesting that these changes were imminent, when in fact it's simply a set of recommendations that haven't been considered by those three levels, the hospital, the land, and the ministry. Wow. 
Mr. Speaker, again to the minister. The hospital has said very clearly, as has the Lynn, these are cuts they have to make because of the health budget that you have presented. Now, what I find more shocking is on December 17th, the minister released his paper, Patients First. He said he wanted to strengthen health outcomes for Indigenous and Francophone communities. Well, what is more hypocritical than putting out a paper in mid-December saying that you want to The member will withdraw. I'll withdraw the word hypocritical. No comments, just simply withdraw, please. Withdraw. Carry on, please. Well, what is more wrong than releasing a paper promising support? then cutting health care to those very same individuals. The chief of Beausoleil First Nation has written you and explained the impact of these cuts Question. to Georgian Bay General will hurt Indigenous communities. The mayor of Penetanguishian has written you saying it will hurt Francophone communities. Monsieur le Président, est-ce que le ministre va arrêter de couper Thank you. Merci. Can the minister explain what is going to happen to the Francophone population? Suggesting that we should never review the sustainability of our hospitals, that we should never get expert advice in terms of changes that can be made to improve the level of care and the quality of care that's being provided. I think I recall, I believe there were more than 100 recommendations, Mr. Speaker, made by this review that were received by the hospital in December. We're currently reviewing those recommendations. The Lynn is reviewing those recommendations. The hospital is reviewing those recommendations. Finally, the member opposite did accept an invitation by the hospital to actually sit down and discuss them. No decisions have been made, Mr. Speaker, and I would implore the Leader of the Opposition is not to inflame the situation, create anxiety where no anxiety is required. Of course, the sort of information that he's alluding to, the community input, is precisely what we're looking to see. We want to make sure that the quality of care is provided is the best possible care. Answer. But there were more than 100 recommendations. The member knows that full well. Nothing's been decided. Thank you. The question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Less than three months ago, the 106 million Nipigon River Bridge opened to traffic. The Minister of Northern Development and Mines described the bridge as the government's crown jewel. But less than two months later, winter came and some bolts snapped in the cold. The $106 million bridge buckled and failed. The failure of this bridge has literally cut Canada in two. How is it possible for the government to spend $106 million without making sure that this bridge could withstand an Ontario winter? And who is responsible for signing off on a bridge that failed upon its first encounter Question. with Ontario River uh, in winter? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker, and I thank the member from uh, from Niagara Falls for the question. As I said earlier today, we anticipate that the bridge will be open. The second lane of traffic will be open on the bridge by the end of February. Speaker, it's just really important to make sure that we have accurate information, not only on this topic but all here in this house. I should mention. Uh, that the design of this bridge, like the design of all of the bridges that we have in the province of Ontario, uh, is done in accordance with the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code, which means that it's capable of withstanding the necessary code design parameters for winds in excess of 100 kilometres an hour in climatic conditions, including free freezing temperatures well below minus 40 degrees Celsius. Speaker. For 100 years, the Ministry of Transportation has built a network, a system of roads, highways, bridges, and public transit across the province of Ontario. Speaker, it's these high standards that we hold ourselves accountable Thanks, to, sir. and we'll have that second lane of traffic open by the end of February. Thanks very much. Thank you. The member from Cambridge, on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to welcome my friend and neighbour from North Dumfries Township, John Holman, to the Legislature today. I'm proud of the work he does as a firefighter. Thank you. Thank you. Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I wonder if I might ask members of the Legislature to join me in congratulating a member of our Legislative Security Services, Sergeant Bruno Romano, on his recent wedding. Congratulations, Bruno. Oh. I think a more appropriate way to acknowledge Bruno would be to snap your fingers. So. Uh, there are no deferred votes. This house stands recessed until 3 p.m. Uh, sorry. One, one moment. One moment.
I was halfway through, but I did notice the Leader of the Opposition. To correct my record, I originally said that Bill 2 sat on the order paper for 244 days, which it, ha which actually correct, it has sat in the order paper for 589 days. Oh. Bill 2 was introduced in 2015. Yeah, the, all members have an opportunity to correct the records. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.